And I'm going to invite my fellow panelists. My presentation is full of images, so if anyone wants to sit down in the front row for this, um, it also um, uh, might make it easier for everyone to see. Okay, very good. Uh, <coughs> well, good morning, and thank you for uh, having me at this event. Um, I'm delighted to be among such a great collage of different viewpoints and uh, subjects and, and knowledge base. I typically am on panels with architects and designers and planners, and you'll be hearing from many of them uh, today, and I guess I'm the first of that bunch, but uh, it really is terrific to see these ideas framed in uh, uh, so many different viewpoints. Um, the heading for the session is job creation, um, but the metric that I'm going to be focusing on a lot in my remarks is tax base. They both describe the same thing, which is economic development, but um, uh, job creation tends to be a bit of a squishy metric. Jobs have a way of oozing back and forth from one political jurisdiction to another. Uh, they're easily double counted. Uh, the great thing about tax base is you know exactly what you collected last year. It's a statistic that recurs every year, and most important, it's the number that tells the city or county manager what they have in their budget next year and what they have in their capital program for five and ten years out. So um, I find it a very useful and important metric. Um, my, um, my show, by the way, I have no bullets in my presentation, but I have many, many slides, and I'm going to try to go through them very quickly. Uh, and let me put my notes aside here. <coughs> the, um, you know, this whole subject having to do with Ford Ord does not really need to be that difficult. Uh, in fact, we're going to take a quick little tour to another part of the country to look at one of my favorite projects, which is also uh, a base reuse project, or actually the reuse of a naval training center in Orlando, a place called Baldwin Park. And it's really only after the fact, after learning about this place and visiting several times, that I was surprised to learn that it was a former military facility. Um, this, by the way, is a picture of the developer, David Pace, uh, who's probably most famous for the fact that he was part of the team that did Disney's Celebration Project. And Celebration is a project that's um, gotten a lot, a lot of attention over the years, even some ridicule uh, for being the, uh, you know, the extension of the great Disney empire. Um, but Baldwin Park, if you have the chance to visit it, it, is an amazing place. The thing you notice first and foremost is the fact that it's very beautiful. It's... it's um, uh, Orlando, Florida area, it's a fairly lush region, beautifully landscaped, but many, many of the detail aspects of the development were very carefully thought out. But beyond the beauty, it also functions well. It functions well for young people, <coughs> for older people, for that 20% of the population that doesn't drive. Um, and it's a real place. It's a place where people are living their lives. And I had a chance to spend uh, a morning photographing it. And uh, it, it, you know, it's really a very photogenic place. There are national builders building homes there. There are custom home builders building million dollar plus homes. Um, but the amazing thing about the whole composition is how all the pieces work rather well together. There's a sense of quality to the whole enterprise. And somehow or another national builders, which oftentimes are very bottom line conscious, really put their best foot forward here and build quality designs with a wide range of architectural styles. It doesn't have that cookie cutter feeling that a lot of communities tend to have when they're doing new construction. Uh, it has parks, it has schools embedded in the fabric. Um, it has a lot of multifamily. A lot of communities fight multifamily, whether it's condo or apartments, on a kind of a knee-jerk basis, saying, you know, we don't want people from a different economic strata from ourselves living here. But again, the architectural variety and, and the sheer beauty of some of these um, products is pretty impressive. You look at this frame, um, it's an apartment building. There's some attention to the detail here. If you took away the architectural ornament and the, the first floor um, balcony, it would just be an empty box. But in fact, the, you know, the way it's built, the proportions of it, it, you know, it, it contributes to the street and the community uh, uh, through its architectural form. And you see a lot of multifamily in the community. And what's interesting, these are the same buildings in the same developments all around them but there's a fair bit of care that's been exercised in the site planning and the way they relate to the street and relate to each other that makes these successful. Um, you know, a very impressive uh, development in many regards, and it shows that a lot of the things that um, typically communities fight new development and fight uh, 
large-scale national development seem to be successful here. It has a real downtown. It has multi-story buildings. There are fairly uh, uh, significant property values that have been generated here, and consequently the tax base that this project contributes is fairly significant. There's a major um, uh, Publix, uh, a Florida-based grocery chain, uh, has a major store there. Um, and again, you see that people are living their lives. You know, this, this fellow, uh, you know, uh, might have been, um, you know, rebalancing his stock portfolio while he's sitting there looking out over the beautiful lake. Um, there's an elementary school just steps away from some of the most affordable housing in the community. Somehow it all seems to fit together rather well and do so in a way that's fairly harmonious with the environment. When you look at these pictures, you realize that it all looks fairly easy when it's done well. You know, like seeing someone up on a trapeze. It, it just seems effortless. Now, a lot of the credit certainly goes to the developer, uh, Mr. Pace, but he didn't act alone. In fact, years before David came on the scene, Rick Bernhardt, <coughs> the long-serving Orlando planning director, laid the groundwork for this project. And it was a project we in the, the business heard about for years. It was a big competition. And one of our favorite designers didn't win the competition. And, you know, the, the, the site plan that came out of it wasn't my favorite, but it shows the power of great execution. Executing well is the thing that's in the sh most short supply these days. There's a lot of good plans around, but the execution is difficult. Now, there was also an investor who was writing the checks for this. I don't know if you follow your politics, Penny Pritzker, she's a big Democratic Party contributor. I believe she was Secretary of Commerce uh, in the first Obama administration. She's from the Hyatt Hotel family. She wrote the checks on this project. Um, hard to know how much involvement she had. Uh, again, you know, the developer ran the project. But what's interesting is Penny is no stranger to this type of development. She also was the investor behind another major project, uh, one in Maryland, called King Farm that was also very successful. So this isn't a case of just an enlightened developer coming out talking about all these great principles. This is about good business. This is about someone being very thoughtful about where they were putting their money. Um, so I'd like to do a few things today. I want to pick up on this point about business and planning and debunk the myth that planning and business can't coexist together. Uh, I want to do that by citing a study that I did as planning director in Sarasota County, Florida uh, for my boss, Jim Lay. Uh, I showed up in Sarasota uh, just as we were plunging into the deepest, nastiest part of the recession, and development ground to a halt in Sarasota County. And my boss, Jim, said, I want to know what's paying the bills around here. Uh, we've had this boom going for a few years. It's difficult to know. And so essentially, we did like a core sample of different development activity throughout the county. The first thing we looked at was our agricultural land. Uh, which is paying uh, $3 an acre, guaranteed, every year. Uh, certainly not enough to run local government with. But the ability to drive out of town and see open land within five minutes was very important to the citizens of the county. It's kind of that, that psychological comfort of saying, you know, it's not just endless sprawl like the east coast of Florida. Um, as you move up through these bars, um, a typical house out in the county uh, on an acre of land or multiple houses on an acre together pay about $3,800. Uh, multifamily, about double that, $7,800. And city residential, like this house, which happened to be mine, paying about $8,100 per acre per year. And this is property tax only. And even though it was in the city, it's just the county portion. And this is a 2008 study, by the way. So it's starting to get a little old, but um, people are continuing to be interested in it. Now, you'd think there'd be a huge difference between what my house paid and those of my neighbors and the big box stores being built in the southern part of the county. But the first big surprise from this study was, in fact, there was a very little difference. If you compare the purple bar and the pink bar, you see the difference of only about $150 per acre per year. Now, this doesn't include the sales tax, which we'll get to in a minute, but that was a big surprise. When the elected officials saw that, their jaws dropped. Now, the best retail facility in the county, uh, uh, Southgate Mall, which had Macy's, Saks Fifth Avenue, and a store called Dillard's, it paid about three times the Walmart, about $21,752 per acre. Here's what it looked like. And of course, what you pay in property taxes is related to your assessed value, which has to do with what your property is worth on the open market. 
So it isn't like there's any smoke and mirrors behind these numbers. We, unlike California with Prop 13, which really confuses the issue, Florida has a fairly, or at least our county, has a fairly flat tax for all different property categories. But you can see this is a building in a good location on the main road into town, quality materials uh, inside and out, and that's the basis for its value. So we're going to change the scale of these charts, and, and, and what you see here uh, right now, you know, those bars have been compressed. They're very, they're very short at the far left end. We're going to extend our chart out to $900,000 per acre per year. Can anyone imagine if the best mall in the county is paying $21,000 per acre per year, what could possibly be paying $900,000 a year? So, well, here it is. It's like, it's like a jack-in-the-box that just jumps across the screen. Three bars for low-rise, mid-rise, and what we call high-rise mixed-use development in the downtown of Sarasota. So that long bar, which we're showing up to about uh, 800000 uh, sits on an acre of land. It's valued at $65.9 million. And the reason why that's so valuable is you're stacking million-dollar condo on top of million-dollar condo. The fact is that single footprint holds a lot of real estate value. And regardless of how you feel about tall buildings, um, that's significant. That's something worth knowing about if you're collecting taxes on behalf of the county. And as you begin to look at this in composite, at that full range from agricultural land, my house, the Walmart or Sam's Club, here's a two-story building in downtown paying 90000 per acre per year, built in 1923, a building that a lot of people would say, well, that's an old obsolete piece of junk. Let's tear it down. But it's generating 10 times the Walmart, and it's just sitting there with its top floor empty. And then here's that $1.2 million per acre per year. It takes a lot of that Walmart to equal what this one building does. Now, when it came time to publish this study, I got nervous because I really didn't quite believe these numbers. They were so dramatic. So I went back up to the finance department. I sat down with Karen Fertangelo, and we went through the numbers. And it's complicated because some of these assemblies, you're putting parcels together, and some of them pay no taxes, others pay the bulk of the taxes, you really need to make sure you're, you, you've got all your data. Well, it turned out we were wrong. We were way off. In fact, that high earner, that building in the lower right, uh, which we thought was 900,000, turned out to be 1.2 million per acre per year because the building only sits on two-thirds of an acre. So the numbers are even more impressive than we thought. So when you compare that one building, which, as I said, we corrected it to be two-thirds of an acre, to our, our, our retail offerings, the new Walmart, 21 acres, and our best performing mall, you put those two retail properties together combined, they only add up to a little over uh, 1.1 million. Uh, compared to that one building downtown, in combined, now we're talking city and county taxes, just under 1.5 million. So there's still a delta of about $350,000. So the big message to our taxpayers was, who is paying the bills in the county? There are a lot of people that never like to go downtown. They hate downtown. But guess what? It's subsidizing them. So on some level, they ought to appreciate it. Now, what about sales tax? Well, it's important, but not as much as you'd think. The total, uh, for the same year this study was done, the total sales tax take was about $60 million compared to $222 million for property tax. And if you think about it, that one building on two-thirds of an acre generating over a million dollars in county taxes, if we had 60 of that building, we could just get rid of sales tax in the county forever. Presumption is they would just keep rolling in. And that looks pretty intense. You know, it's a lot of buildings. But if, you, if it's sitting only on two-thirds of an acre, you realize that would basically fill a site comfortably of 100 acres. And our downtown is about 600 acres. So on one-sixth of downtown, we could build buildings that could make our sales tax go away forever. They'd be like they're all living in Oregon, you know, the best of both worlds. Florida, no income tax. Oregon, no sales tax. So, um, and if you think about it, our downtown today is mostly one- and two-story buildings. There's a few towers, so people are psychologically used to the idea of tall buildings, which can be a little bit of a jolt when there's just one standing out by itself. I saw a hotel down the way that looked a little... A little bare, I'm not sure I'd want to see that, but Sarasota's downtown has some towers, so to add a few more wouldn't be the end of the world. In fact, if you go up to um, St. Petersburg, about an hour up the road, 
little bigger town, they probably built that amount of square footage in the last boom that we're talking about. And guess what? St. Petersburg did not become a terrible place in that process. In fact, there's more people now to shop in the galleries and eat in the restaurants, and the street life is livelier. So St. Petersburg really improved with that additional development. So what about the cost side? Well, it's a bit of an old study. Uh, we'd love to update it. But uh, uh, a 1989 study with the dollars updated showed that a downtown unit uh, in similar Florida towns were costing local government about $9,200 to, um, to allow them to be built, to do the uh, initiating infrastructure, whereas the suburban a uh, single-family house out in the subdivision was of almost three times that at 23,000. So if you cross-cut those two numbers and look at the difference between three downtown buildings uh, versus 357 units out on the edge occupying 30 acres, the downtown buildings only two together, the county's investment is completely, the first year, a third is paid back, 35%, whereas out on the edge only 2%, uh, you look at the life of what's essentially a loan from local government to the developer, and what you see is the downtown buildings are completely paid back in three years. The suburban uh, single-family dwellings, actually these are some garden apartments, take 42 years, and that's no interest being paid. So when you think about it, government is a partner in new development. Every time you approve a project, you are taking on the responsibility of servicing that development for its entire life. The roads, the water taps, the sewer, all these different things. There are monthly charges, but you're putting in the infrastructure to enable that development to happen. Look at what's bringing the return. Okay, if you were an investor, if it's purely private sector, what investment decision would you make here? Okay? Um, and again, those suburban apartment, the mortgage on most buildings is 30 years. If we've got a 42-year payback with no interest, I've lived in Florida. I can tell you, you can actually hear the bugs eating your house. They're chomping away. You need like three different kinds of termite protection. You know, dry wood, wet wood. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Um, so, you know, what's the reason for the difference in cost? Well, it's how hard your infrastructure is working. Uh, that downtown street has parked cars, cars that are driving. They're moving 24 hours a day. There's people eating dinner by the side of that road. Uh, when that building went into the left in the frame, they probably dug a six-inch trench to put in some fiber optic cable, and that was it. On the right, however, for those 357 units, they put in this new five-lane road. I'm standing on the median at 11 on a Saturday morning, the same time the photo on the left was taken. Not a single car goes by me in five minutes. Not a well-used piece of infrastructure. So, um, you know, now the interesting thing, downtown Sarasota had done a lot right over the years. It's a lively downtown, uh, which puts it ahead of many, many Florida cities. It's got thriving restaurants. They, the, the city redid the parking for Diagonal Head Inn and planted some trees. A very pleasant place to stroll. Part of what drives the value in these buildings is not just the blue water ocean views. In fact, this building only gets partial views, but it's the street life down below. It's the investment local government made in a walkable, bikeable, pleasant place to pass the time. And in theory, one could create an infinite supply of those kinds of places. Now, here's another project down in Naples, that same sort of density uh, that we're talking about, two and three stories. And projects like this are outperforming our best mall, three to one. This, uh, this low-rise building is yielding $90,000, $100,000 per acre per year. The mall, only 23000 The mall has a finite amount of customers that will shop there. Beyond that, you get oversaturated, whereas creating great residential product for people who are moving into the region, and people do tend to move down to Florida, you could theoretically do that on an almost infinitive basis. So the question for decision makers comes, well, where do you put these high value places? Well, I told you before, downtown's a perfect place. But remember, I'm working for the county, and in our county plan, this is, this is downtown, their land use plan, but it just appears as gray in our county plan. We're not really coordinating between the city and the county in this way. We want to find places that we can put high value real estate too. And so where would we do that? Well, as it happens, we built miles and miles of roads that look like that. Big, wide, high traffic roads. And really, people don't want to live on roads like that. Big box retail wants to be there. 
But I already showed you the big box doesn't earn at any higher rate than single family houses do. So why would we spend that infrastructure money? Why would we do that? Well, we're not going to put them on big arterials, but we might put them on transit. And at the time, we had an application into the Fed for a, a fairly ambitious BRT program. Um, that picture on top is Portland, Oregon. I don't think our citizens would have gone for that. They would have said, oh, those buildings are too gray, they're too tall. But they might have gone for this picture on the left, which is actually, I think, from San Jose, a proposal. Uh, so we think that along those fixed rail uh, uh, transit lines around town would be a good place to do that type of development. Now, the second thing I wanted to do is have a quick look as an outsider at what's going on here. Years ago, um, I heard a lot of really interesting things happening with planning in Fort Ord. I know there were some very prestigious firms associated with the project. And then I, I didn't hear much. And so I was interested to come on down here. Um, we got some materials sent to us in advance, and we looked through these. Uh, this is the reuse plan, which is a, has a lot of good words in it. Um, very impressive. Uh, read through it, got the key design principles, uh, noted some words in particular, unique identity, natural landscape, mixed-use development, villages, diverse neighborhoods, sustainable, and so on. Good words, good stuff. I'm all about this stuff. Um, so I went digging particularly on mixed-use development. I went to that chapter. I started looking at the words. Um, encourage a development pattern, mixes uses, uh, readily discernible edges, compact community form, all the things I'm about, uh, particularly this one, you know, scale and pattern of development which is appropriate to a village environment and is friendly to the pedestrian and cyclist. Good stuff. Let's hear it. So I came down and I had a look and I went to the main corner and I saw a big box mall. And I said, wait a minute, that's not what the words say. Um, and I looked around some more, I saw some big roads that had gone in, um, and I'm confused. So, you know, I go back to the hotel, and I'm looking through the book again. I'm looking at all these photos. I recognize some of them from College Avenue in Berkeley, a wonderful street. I'm guessing maybe some of the consultants were, were Berkeley-based. And again, though, I'm still not reconciling that to what I saw out on the site. And there's a lot of pictures, drawings, that show a continuous network of streets and blocks, Small blocks, these are all things that urbanists feel are very important. Uh, really good concepts. And you look at the label, and again, it's, it's labeled housing, retail, office, in mixed-use pattern. And, and that's right. Uh, you know, picture and the words match. But what's not matching is what I saw out on site. And I, I thumbed through a few more pages. Here's more drawings. Again, same concept. These are good streets and blocks. But then I go on Google Earth and I look at the place that I saw earlier and I said, but that's not matching the picture. That's a big box mall. That's a sea of asphalt. And so I, I don't know um, what's happening here. And then I look a little closer. I see a kind of interesting thing labeled Transit Street. And I follow the arrow down. I see the dotted line. It looks like railroad tracks. You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then I thumb further. I see some streetcars. Wow, are they thinking of streetcars here? I love streetcars. Okay, yeah, I just got back from Europe and they had them all over. It's fantastic. And you can really do great urbanism with streetcars. It means you don't have to park all those cars. It talks about future transit right of way for efficient movement. Good stuff. But again, I'm trying to square this with the pictures and with the roads. And, and I saw plenty wide roads. There's probably room for streetcars on those roads, but I, I didn't see any provision for them. You know, when you build roads like this, these are expensive. And so you want to make sure if you're thinking about streetcars, you make the accommodations ahead of time. But I didn't see that. I didn't read any more about them. So I have a question. I, I don't know. Transit is a powerful shaper of place. And, you know, it's a lot of times people in smaller communities don't really think of it because, well, they don't have the traffic jams of a, of a San Francisco or a L.A. Or a, but, you know, it, it can be, even in smaller towns, it can be a great shaper of form. And then I looked at the land use map. And, you know, I'm a new urbanist. We, we think that land use is important, but it's only one of about 20 other important things. So we use different kinds of documents to, to draw uh, up our plan. There's a thing called plan drift that sometimes happens, that I think may be happening here, where the plan says one thing and what's getting built is something else. But don't feel bad, because it happens all the time, all over America. 
And one of the reasons is the nature of the planning documents we create are vague and squishy. They're not precise. Because being vague serves a lot of people in the process because they need that flexibility, that wiggle room. What new urbanists prefer, and what you're probably going to hear more about, is something called form-based codes, where we draw a fairly detailed picture called an illustrative plan to show the rooftops. We then um, uh, uh, reference that back to something called a regulating plan. And the regulating plan calls for a series of building types that each have places within that plan. So it's a fairly precise methodology. And then there's street types. It's a kit of parts. And again, the term for it is a form-based code. So others will speak about that. <clears throat> the third part of what I wanted to talk about is how one can do things better going forward. And I think there's some real possibilities for that. I noted that principle number six, adopt regional urban design guidelines. Th that'd be a good starting point for what one can do better. Now, I'm gonna share some stuff about planning. I <clears throat> I'm not an apologist for planning. In fact, there's a lot of things about planning that I have real issues with. And I'm going to share a dirty little secret about regional plans. They're all the buzz. The federal government did a huge program called Sustainable Communities. Great program. But even those great plans have a problem. And the problem is, is that they often fail to link to zoning. You get to the end of this planning process and everybody's, oh, wow, this is fabulous, but it doesn't key directly into the regulations that control the build out of our world. You have to start all over again. And it's usually with a different cast of characters, a new board of advisors and so on, new consultants. Most plans today are what I call dialing for dollars. It's all about the road system and which segments are failing. There's a lot of concern about levels of service. And one of the reasons is that the functions of most regional plans is about getting money from the federal government for various localities. There's software programs that model which segments are failing. Um, there's lots and lots of literature about how do you do your transportation modeling. Um, and the, uh, the product is that your roads keep expanding. Uh, in Sarasota County, we had an application for eight years to the Fed to widen a road. By the time we finally got around to doing it, the county administrator really thought it was a mistake, but there was money coming, there were jobs, <coughs> so we just rolled ahead with the process. And again, a lot of times at the heart of it is this transportation model. I don't know if you can see that cartoon. <coughs> Commissioner saying another new highway and the, the, the technician saying, the model made me do it. Well, you built some new roads and those roads are gonna be the shaper of the community around them. They're gonna be the armature of your urban form. Typically roads are the first thing in. We spent a fortune on them in Sarasota a lot of times, though, the money to pay for them would be paid for by developers. So when staff would get up and present $38 million worth of improvements, so-called improvements, the taxpayers would be, you know, normally be gasping. We'd say, it's okay. It's all being paid for by the developers. Don't worry. The problem is what's not being paid for by the developers is the maintenance, the upkeep, replacing the pipes underneath the roads. So when you commit yourself to this gold-plated infrastructure, it's a forever deal. You've got to generate the taxes to continue to cover the costs. And I can tell you that can be a problem. Um, now, what's interesting is there is a new generation of plans that acknowledges a fundamentally different characteristic of public transit than roads. And, and it's very significant. When you model roads, you're always having to look at each segment and which segment is failing. But when you're dealing with public transit, your major concern is making a point-to-point -point connection. So we have two stops, one on that side, two on this side. And you've got a right-of-way, and in this case, it's a busway in Washington, D.C. You're not going to be widening roads anytime soon because you're not going to have to rip your infrastructure out and pull those buildings away from each other to make more room for lanes. Your infrastructure is an investment that remains, and you build on it. Okay, no more... There's some modeling, but nowhere near as much as you're doing currently. And what happens is you're adding new lines, adding new stops, adding more usage of this, this, this public transit corridor. You're growing your real estate base alongside of it. So you don't have these violent uh, 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 plateaus where the whole world has to get ripped up and changed. Now, one of the other reasons why the modeling is less important is because that big pot of money in Washington, D.C., 
that everyone was drawing from, which is basically gas tax that's paid at the pump every time you fill up your car, that highway trust, trust fund, you see this chart here, sometime around 2009, it dipped into negative territory, and it's been dropping ever since. So all the action is leaving Washington, D.C. in terms of road building. It's going to be state, county, it's going to be local sources that are going to be funding that. So, you know, the feds don't care anymore because they don't have the money. Actually, they have a little bit of money, but it's, it's going fast. <clears throat> now, there is a new kind of regional plan, and the reason why I mention that, you know, if you're going to be... If you're going to be doing this, you need to know what state of the art is. A lot of people point to the Portland plan, which is really just a plan with a whole lot of dots on it. And the question is, what are in those dots? So I'm an inquisitive person. I ask a question. This is actually San Diego. Now, what's, I worked in Oceanside, California, and um, this was our Bible. This was our regional growth plan from Sandag, and it had all these different dots, all these different names, community center, town center, urban center. And each one of those represented numerical values. And you have to look really close, but you know, here's downtown, 75 plus dwelling units to the acre, 80 plus employees. And here's the next one down, urban center, 40 to 75 plus, 25 plus dwelling units. All these numbers. Well, why are the numbers so important? Because the analysts at Sandag plug in these numbers into their transportation models to predict demand. But again, they're moving rapidly from a road-focused transportation system, hopefully to something that's more public transit-focused. So in theory, the need to do all these calculations really ought to go away. All that traffic modeling is really about building roads. Well, again, with transit, all you're concerned about is the point-to-point -point connections. If you get the forecast wrong, if you didn't order enough trains, you order some more. If you order too many, you put them in a barn for a few years, and you wait till the demand comes up. It takes the pressure off that whole enterprise, and it allows you to build more permanent, more robust infrastructure that doesn't have to get ripped up. So the new kind of regional plan, if, if you're not modeling trips, what are you doing? Well, you're talking about what you want to be when you grow up as a region. And uh, Peter Calthorpe, who did that Portland plan and an early San Diego plan, is a real pioneer in this thinking. And uh, his plan for Portland really looked at what was in those dots. You know, one of them, Clackamas, was an old shopping mall that was going to be uh, uh, retrofitted with urban blocks. Uh, Beaverton, a suburban town center, was going to complete its build out. Uh, there were very specific physical interventions in mind for each of these dots. And of course, it's not a surprise that that thinking found its way to the federal government in the Sustainable Communities Program. And one of the reasons why it's not a surprise is that Shelley Petitia, one of the architects of that program, actually worked for Peter for many, many years. And so there's a real commonality of thinking. But again, it's more than just quality of life we're talking about. We're talking about really what are the bones of a great region. And we really need to remember that cities, towns, and neighborhoods are all physical places. We've got buildings that come together to form blocks. There's very specific ways they do that. Um, you know, certain buildings require different lot depths than others. So there are people who understand this and are good at putting that together. Blocks combine with other blocks to form neighborhoods. Neighborhoods combine with other neighborhoods to form towns, cities, and regions. These are physical things. You can't create them with policies alone. At some point, you need to start drawing detailed pictures like the ones in your plan that didn't seem to have been followed. Um, the new kind of regional trend talks a lot of, plan talks a lot about transit, as Portland's does. And what's important, you know, there's this great mystique of the comprehensive plan. All these different things, arts, culture, citizen involvement, agriculture, all very, very important stuff. But what Portland said is, you know what, we're overwhelmed with information. We can't draw a map with all those levels. So we're going to just focus on two things, on land use and transportation. And that's what drove their plan. Now this diagram is a really important, for those of the more academic persuasion in the group, consider this diagram. What you're seeing on the left is an axis going up that deals with detail and specificity. What you're seeing on the right is strategic principles, overarching points. The, the dotted line box is the box of comprehensiveness. What they're saying in the chart is you can be one or the other. There's a time for principles, and there's a time for details. If you try to do it all, you just, you have all this detail, and the minute you change 
uh, underlying principle, the detail has to be redone. It's a lot of work. So go for one or go for the other. And I believe the time is coming to now start to focus on the detail. Um, again, I said before, regional plans fail to link to zoning. Now, somebody may come up and challenge me and say, well, we did one that plugged into the zoning. Uh, but in general, they, they don't tend to do that. Here was a very visionary plan. I was on a peer review panel in um, Tampa, Florida. And a very, a very thoughtful plan uh, for the North Hillsborough County. Uh, and basically, they laid out a series of what are called TODs and TNDs. TODs, transit-oriented development. TND, traditional neighborhoods. And uh, it made a lot of sense. Very straightforward, very clear, very physical. Um, the only problem was is that all of this information had to be sent up to Tallahassee to be approved by a very powerful state agency called Department of Community Affairs. And in the several years that it took them to think about this plan, a lot of the properties that w they were hoping to acquire for open space preservation got sold. We were heading into the boom at the time. And so the bureaucracy couldn't keep up with the market. And uh, so, you know, a, r a real sort of warning on, on this point. So, you know, this issue of not meshing, the lack of a meshing between these visionary regional plans and your day-to-day -day zoning is a subject that staff doesn't want to talk about and consultants don't want to talk about. They're so exhausted from having completed the regional plan. It's like, oh my goodness, you, now you want to talk to me about zoning? Um, but it really needs to be considered. And the way I would suggest doing that, and one that um, was proposed for the largest regional plan in the country for Charleston, was to actually work up, move up in scale from the building types and the street types and start to think about neighborhood types. What does define a small town in the Charleston region or a, uh, a, a, a corridor? So what if you put together a catalog and said, here's what these places look like. This is what a transit corridor looks like. These are the kinds of buildings you're likely to find. These are the, the types of, this is the way it's meant to function regionally. But get physical. Don't talk about things in the abstract. And so again, this dovetails perfectly into the form-based code. Um, it brings precision. And again, though, the, the, the precision is the antidote for the plan drift that you may be experiencing. How do you get precision? You get it by, I'm going to skip through these because I see we're short on time. But, you know, you, you move from the broad brush that you get at the comp plan level, these very simple large areas blocked out in color, but with no more specificity than what land use they are, and you get into the spine grains, slicing and dicing. Now, when I say the word slicing and dicing, if you're my generation, you'll remember a product called the Vegematic. What we need is we need a Vegematic to take us from the coarse comp plans that we now use to the fine-grained detail plans. And the vegematic essentially for this process is the charrette process, which you're going to be hearing about more. There's a couple people in the picture that are actually among the speakers. Um, but this is how you do it. If you want to get to that precision level, and again, I'm not suggesting this for the whole area all at once. You do it area by area. You engage the citizens. But when people know what's coming, when they know where that larger building is going to go and they know whether or not it affects their view, they're likely to be bolder about accepting density in their community. So it involves engaging people. Um, so here's where I usually talk about transit. I'm running low on time, so I'll just show you some quick pictures. This is transit, not in New York or Chicago, but in the small town of Livermore. It's called Main Street USA, but I can tell you it's Livermore. It shows that you have the ability to just add a few stories to your buildings, which doubles and triples the tax base. Here we are in uh, San Jose, uh, what that might look like, what that probably will look like, and in my then town of Sarasota. Now, why did my boss, Jim Lay, want to do this development that would, ma would be made possible with transit? Well, because of this. He wanted to augment the tax base of the community. He knew the only way to do it was to grow buildings. Nice buildings, not huge towering buildings, but buildings that fit people's expectations of what Sarasota could be. The dots are what's paying the bills. Uh, so I think with that, and, and again, scale-wise, what I've done is I've shown the Portland plan, I've shown your region. What you realize is that Fort Ord, the land area you're dealing with, even though the bulk of that land is gonna go into preservation, the developed land is still probably larger 
than the built-out portions of Monterey. You're talking about building another Monterey here. I hate to break it to you, um, but you have the opportunity to really work um, from scratch. I'm going to end it right here. Um, thank you all very much, and I will be present for the next two days. Um, uh, one of the things I love about what I do is when people ask me to come to their town, they say, Peter, give it to us straight. Um, if I were staff working locally, I probably wouldn't have said some of the things I said uh, because I live here. But I get on a plane and I go home. And um, I do occasionally actually get work by being straight with people. So um, uh, feel free to call on me if I can be helpful going forward and certainly uh, over this uh, colloquium. Happy to be part of this. Thank you.